Um, I'd just like to welcome you to the second uh, webinar being hosted by Pointing. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Stephen Frenemann. I'm the product manager for antennas at Pointing Group. Uh, this webinar provides an overview of antenna implementation and considerations and is intended to provide a general introduction to guide you through the most important aspects to be considered. Please feel free to ask any questions during the webinar. Uh, you'll see there's a panel where you can just raise some questions via text um, and, we'll raise, and we'll address these questions directly after the webinar, either directly in the webinar or via emails afterwards. Presenting today, I introduce you to Dr. Andre Ferry. Um, Dr. Andre Ferry is the chairman of Pointing Group. He's a specialist in um, the topic of RF engineering and generally in antennas. Uh, PC Andre's credentials for yourself on the screen. Over to you, Andre. Um, great stuff, Stephen. Thanks very much for everyone attending. Um, great to see a, a number of people from all parts of the world. Um, let me just switch on my webcam. Um, just uh, so you can see that I'm actually real. Most of the presentation will be done without the webcam because it tends to get into the way of, of actual um, useful information. Um, we're going to take you, I just want to take my own webcam out of the way here. Uh, factors affecting your RF experience. So we're looking at propagation, uh, those types of issues, uh, choosing the correct antenna, and then the practical aspects involved in putting a link together, putting antennas up and so forth. I really hope it will be interesting and we'll now blank the webcam and carry on with the presentation. Um, the first part is, is really the, the sort of basics of um, propagation. If you look at this here, um, this is indicating a low frequency. Typically, if you talk about uh, the cellular bands, this would be around 900, 800, 700 megahertz. You can see that the frequencies will increase on this side. Now, if you look at the sort of scenarios, we typically find that people use these low frequencies in the rural um, type of environments. The reasons for that is quite interesting in the sense that these frequencies penetrate bushes, vegetation, and they also give you longer distances. So if you look at the coverage, Typically, the coverage is sparse in the sort of rural areas, but because you're using the low frequencies, you can get better distances. So cell density is low. And of course, fortunately, you also don't have too much um, people accessing. So capacity is not a big issue because the bandwidth here is also fairly low. So as you go up in the spectrum, to get to the city type of environments, um, people would typically be using 1700 up to most probably three gigahertz in terms of the type of frequencies using in the LTE type of systems. The problems with these frequencies are that certainly the uh, cell densities get very high. They have to because for these frequencies to get into buildings is very difficult. So you need to have something that's almost line of sight of you in order to get in. Indoor coverage becomes pretty disastrous. Uh, they don't penetrate things well. And we'll show you a lot about that a little bit later. The other aspect is that capacity there becomes an issue. So most of the um, problems that you find is because this cell base station don't have the capacity uh, to, to handle all of the data that's required. And that's one of the areas where external antennas help a lot because um, you give the cellular operator a much better spectral usage so you can steal quite a lot of his capacity he's going to prefer serving you to other users that's accessing the network at a very slow data rate because of a low signal to noise um, ratio that um, they will have if they um, don't have proper antennas installed if we look at the radio propagation and environment and this comes from many questions we've had over the years we're going to discuss rain um, at some point. People always wonder about trees, foliage. Of course, this is the nice situation where you've got a guy um, standing outside and he's got line of sight. And then what you typically find is if a guy's inside a building or inside a house, 
um, the signal will drop very rapidly. And we find that drop that you get, uh, that you see over there, roughly about 16 dB in, uh, in total. It was not only a drop in signal in terms of penetrating, it's also a lot of multipath because the higher frequencies will pass through the windows, doors, and so forth, but they will reflect and, in a sense, make the reliability of a connection with antennas indoors um, very bad. So uh, getting outdoors, certainly, in these cases, is a massive, massive advantage. If we look at the clutter elements, and I think this is a very, very important slide, once again, just because of the questions we get related to these aspects. Which are the things that really um, cut down on signal? In other words, stop a signal from penetrating. The most, um, what do you call it, severe effect, and we've measured this, is reflective glass and double glazing. I'm talking here about your typical office buildings that got the gold coatings, um, and they're actually metal coatings on that glass, and the, you virtually get no penetration. So you still get penetration into the buildings, but that's, like I always say, via the cracks, nooks, and crannies. Um, so that's really a severe effect. Bricks, concrete, rock, metal, of course, um, it's, it's a big block to the signal. Then, and this I will discuss in a lot of detail, and trees close by is a has a severe impact on signal strength. That doesn't mean that trees in general is a big problem. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Normal glass, dry hollow walls, not such a big impact. In other words, if you look at these aspects, you'll get a number of dBs lost. You still suffer from the multipath once you're inside, but the penetration is actually not too bad. Then you've got trees blocking line of sight. They're actually not too bad. And I'll show you later why not. In other words, if you've got a, a heap of trees in between you and the base station, but they're not very close to either the base station or yourself. There's actually a fairly good penetration and we've both measured it and it's known theoretically. Then this is a question I often get where people say, rainfall, um, does it impact on communication? Now I can tell you, um, if you're below six gigahertz, which is the upper ISM band and lower, rainfall's virtually got zero impact on communication. The reason why some people do find some impact is if you do have trees in the way, the tree absorption, because there's a lot of water on all of the leaves, that does increase. But rainfall itself, you don't have to worry about. It's almost the equivalent of free space. Especially over small distances, it becomes a big impact at about 10 gigahertz. So that's why your satellite TV really suffers when there's a, a lot of clouds and rainfall in the area. Here we get to the tree story. And uh, this was actually something that surprised me in the sense that people have found that if you look at a number of trees, say in the middle of a link, you do find that much of the propagation is sort of by reflections, and that's in between the trees, below the trees, um, through the tops and so forth. And you get to this side, and we, for example, have measured over, um, say, 300 meters, and uh, there's a nice little article on the LinkedIn profile, that we can get um, 100 megabits up speeds at Wi-Fi, in other words, about five gigahertz, when we've got up to 60 meters of trees in the way, but then they are in the middle of the link somewhere. What happens here is, of course, since these propagation modes are going around the tops, bottoms, and so forth, if you've got trees very close to the house, you actually do get a severe impact of that. So it's quite important that if a tree is, and I'm talking here close by, a few meters away from your antenna, then that tree is no longer can be neglected because the penetration through the actual leaves is not at all good. Here we look at the, the obstacle clearance. Now people talk of line of sight, okay, and that's of course important. Most of these high frequencies people say, you can get good communication if you're in line of sight. Now, um, there is a, a factor known as the Fresnel zones, and we can give you equations to work out what's that sort of width of the zone, and that has to clear the obstacle. If the obstacle is actually sort of in the Fresnel zone, and these zones depend on the distance between the links as well as the frequency, then it starts having an impact. 
not severe um, if it doesn't actually block the line of sight, but roughly speaking, you, you could get sort of 3 dB reduction in signal. If the object actually blocks your line of sight, then it gets more severe and you get most probably about 15 dB. There's still a certain amount of it diffracted around the object. Now, this is a quite simplistic drawing because you must remember it could also be clearing the sides of buildings. So if you've got a big building in front of you and the line of sight goes very close to the side of that building, it could still have um, some kind of impact. The one aspect one have to take into account in a city environment, there's also reflections. Um, reflections can often give you still reasonably good um, data links, even if you've got a building in the front of you, because of course you could be receiving that signal. And when we get to the choice of antennas, you'll see this is quite important. And also when you talk of um, MIMO, in other words, signals with multiple input, multiple output, this is sometimes quite useful because it can actually increase your data because you've got more than one path between a um, transmitter and the receive antenna. Here's a little sort of scenario. Um, here you've got, say, very close trees. And you can see on this side, it's often quite useful just to go further away from these trees. Of course, going up is also useful, but just moving further away from them gives the wave time to expand and get through, like I say, the gaps and so forth in the tree. So as counterintuitive as it may seem, it's quite good to sometimes move back and it's typically always good to move higher. Here's another instance where part of the house could actually be cutting off the beam of this antenna. Once again, you can actually move it there just to make sure that you've got a clean beam facing the base station. And of course, that part is still cut off there and much better to get it so that within the beam of the antenna, and we always publish the beam width, you've got no part of the house or, op, uh, or the building um, obstructing the signal. Best is, of course, always if you haven't got ob obstacles, you can actually just go on that side of the house that faces the or building that faces the base station. This is an important one just because, once again, we get lots of questions. In the olden days, we only looked at signal to noise ratio, and, and that's effectively the amount of signal that you get on your side relative to the amount of interference or the noise in the receiver itself. Lately, with LTE, you'll see two factors. The one is called RSRP, reference signal received power, or RSRQ. Um, this is because if you look at um, LTE and these signals, there's actually multiple channels, um, close to 100 channels getting transmitted next to each other. And this looks at that complete picture. So typical signal to noise is not good enough anymore. And I think these are excellent reference values. Um, so you need to get all of these, but mainly these ones if you're looking at the LTE signal. And these are indicators of what would be good, excellent, mid-cell, and edge-cell. And they had some relationship. But what I do want to note is that you could get this guy, say, in, in a good value. But if you've got the RSRQ or the RSRP lower, then you actually do still have a problem. So they're not necessarily directly related. Um, and I would focus on these two. And they are directly related. So if one or both are good, you typically have got a good link. That covers the first part. And I think the most important part and most probably difficult for anyone not dealing directly in antennas is the choice of antenna. Now, I would say the, the things that you have to look at is first the technology. Um, of course, the most important, what frequencies um, that specific technology covers. You have to take into account what could happen in the future, and I'll show you good examples of those. And then you have to see, is the technology, does it use things like um, multiple input, multiple output? Um, then you have to look at the application in size, shape. In other words, if you're going to mount something on a vehicle, um, it's a completely different case to mounting it outside a house. Environmental and certification. And then the requirements. Do you need to receive from all directions? What's the signal levels? Is it very low? Is it reasonable? A polarization. And 
how high a throughput do you need? And I'm going to show that, and it's quite an important thing. I'm not really speaking to our business, but you don't always need MIMO, even if the technology um, requires or uses MIMO. You can get quite satisfactory performance if you don't need very high data throughput. And then, of course, the most important part, connectors, coax cables, brackets, mounting, lightning, and so forth. Now, this is a nice one. Um, this is a South African, but I think most probably typically in most part of the world. Right when we started the cellular antennas, there was the 900 band on there in the United States. It uh, was the AMPS band, which is about 800. So if you look at this, this would be the gain performance of a Yagi antenna. Many people at that time used Yagi antennas to boost their signal strength outdoors. And of course, it worked quite well. A Yagi antenna is quite narrow, but it performs well in this band. Um, this antenna you see here would be, for example, our LPDA92, which has got a very, very broad band. Its peak is not as high as the Yagi. But if we now, and this is what I refer to as being future proof, there's a famous saying in uh, ice hockey that says, you mustn't go to where the puck is, you must go to where the puck will be. And this sort of illustrates it. Uh, very soon thereafter, the higher bands, 17, 1800 bands were added. Um, the moment 3G sort of happened, we got the UMTS bands, which if you look at frequency here, yeah, it's about 2.1 gigahertz got added. And if you were using that antenna, the operators typically would move their data to the higher bands, and this guy would be lost. You, you actually will need to go and put another antenna up, otherwise you will forever sit with GPRS or H, which were um, 2G data technologies. Um, as life progressed, we're going to 4G LTE. Those bands were added. We got here the the TV bands that got reformed, in other words, uh, they call it the uh, digital dividend bands, which is used for 4G, and some higher bands that's getting used. And with 5G, this is going to get much worse. But you have to, you can't always forecast when you were there that these were going to happen, but you have to take into account that these may have happened. So just look at it in terms of what may happen, otherwise you may be, um, in a, in a creek with no paddle, um, like this case here. This is a question we often get, because when we write a spec or a brochure for an antenna, we would say this is a 2G, 4G, whatever antenna. But the biggest message here is antennas don't care about technology. In other words, they radiate, and they've got a gain and a bandwidth and all their properties at a certain frequency. So even though not all the antennas may be so specified for Wi-Fi, many of our LTE antennas actually would cover Wi-Fi bands. And if they do, they will work. The same with technologies such as RFID, ZigBee. Um, these guys operate at uh, sort of 680, uh, sorry, yeah, 680 megahertz. Many of the GSM antennas that we make work at that band. ZigBee is at 2.4, license free. Uh, not even sure where Z-Wave is, but um, oh, it's actually indicated over there. Um, if you look at uh, LoRa, um, so even though antenna may not be marked as a LoRa antenna, Sigfox antenna, etc., etc., if it's operational and its performance is within that frequency band, it doesn't care. It doesn't know whether it's called the LoRa or whatever antenna. It will radiate um, waves in the frequency bands that it's specified for. So I think that's an important point. Note the bands, here they are. And if an antenna operates there, it will operate in that application. It does not need to be called a LoRa antenna, for example. Applications. This is most probably one of the most important parts because I've just indicated some of them here. Households, you may have outdoor antennas um, that you wish to mount on households could be directional, could be omnidirectional. What you have to consider is the shape, size, how do you mount them, environmental, in other words, are they going to be in the rain, are they going to be in uh, uh, chemical environments, are they going to be indoors, and certifications. If you look at the commercial side, sometimes you have to use little flat antennas like that just because the devices or boxes that they're mounted on 
would not allow for an antenna like that to be um, used in those circumstances. Sometimes they could be an antenna like that, which will be directional. So it will only communicate in the specific directions. And this guy here would be much bigger than this one or that one. Mining is an interesting area where we've been very successful in terms of getting antennas. We designed the first Healy antennas for underground tunnels many, many years ago. Um, this is mainly for Wi-Fi underground. And um, in the last sort of five, six years, we've seen heavy use of these antennas for underground communications. Um, these are helical antennas giving you propagation. We've had reports of one kilometer and more between a base station using this type of antenna which of course sits very tightly against the sides of a tunnel and say a handheld Wi-Fi device. A year certification is a big issue. And you can see this darker one is actually intrinsically safe. They have to have an anti-static covering in order to be um, qualified as in, uh, intrinsically safe and very specific antennas for that environment. This type of Omni, we've also now got qualified as uh, uh, intrinsically safe antenna, but uh, in that case, it's for the, the sort of front ends where people are working and you do want omnidirectional coverage. In other words, not tunnels per se. This is often on the vehicles. And then automotive, we know that we can't fit the antennas on the left-hand side. They typically often have to be low profile, nicely shaped. In this case, um, this would be the MIMA 1, which has got both dual Wi-Fi, dual LTE and GPS antennas built into a single very low profile box. Environmental, water, sparks. Okay, we, we couldn't get a graphic because this is mainly underground in, say, coal mines. You have to look at temperature. Um, most of the antennas that we do um, actually get tested down to pretty low temperatures, often down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Of course, high temperatures the same. They have to actually be tested. Salt spray is extremely important and not always for antennas just mounted on boats. Um, just in terms of the general corrosion and resistance. Chemical, also in terms of the hazardous materials, we have to we test all of the um, components we put into the antennas um, using um, a, a spectra analysis to find out that they don't have any of the hazardous materials in them. Wind, they have to survive, they can't be blown down. UV is the most important. All our other antennas, of course, are UV treated, but you only discover a year or two down the line with an antenna that you've purchased have got plastic components that will disintegrate in UV or will actually survive. Um, and ruggedness. Um, ultimately, antennas on vehicles like this have to be quite rugged to survive. If you look at the type of antenna, omni versus directional is typically the, the main issue. And this is just looking at a Wi-Fi case. The reason why this is a Wi-Fi case, this is where you've got a base station um, that has to cover users. So omnidirectional, say position there, would be able to talk to all of these guys, but most probably with a lower signal level. Here you would have an antenna that covers, say, a 60 or 70 degree sector. So it will be able to talk to these guys here, but won't have much signal in these directions. They are very useful, even indoors, because if you indoors, for example, the signal traveling this way may just cause a reflection. So you could put this guy in a corner of a building and that will give a much better coverage than an Omni antenna because the Omni is actually just giving you multipath. In other words, it's um, getting much more interference from reflections in directions we, in any case, do not want to communicate um, to. Um, I think I've said all on the right hand side. The most important one is most probably the opposite case. Um, which is in a cellular situation where you are the customer. In other words, we haven't got a base station. We've got a customer. And here I find it's most important to make some decisions. Um, you've got an Omni here. An Omni here has got the advantage that it will receive a number of stations, sometimes giving you redundancy, but also someone may build a new station and in which case it will be able to use it. If you use a directional antenna, it only faces this way, typically directed at a base station. If that guy's capacity is, for example, at a peak, then 
you have to live with it. It can't go and talk to another base station. If you want to talk to more than one operator for redundancy purposes, you can't do that. So my rule is typically, um, if you want to have redundancy amongst various cells, ease of installation, because you don't have to point the thing, um, and you don't have a very massive signal problem. In other words, you must remember that just taking the antenna from indoor to outdoor gives you about 16 dB of improvement in signal. Very often that's enough. So I think very often people don't use Omnis. If an Omni is good enough, it's always better to use it. Um, in terms of MIMO, we will discuss it a bit later, you can still use Omnis. You just have to use two of them spaced appropriate, uh, uh, far enough apart to use space diversity. If you do have a very bad signal problem, in other words, the signal even outdoors is not great, and often this is in rural or faraway situations, or you do know that you're going to talk to this operator, directional is often the best. And directional, also in terms of NEMO, gives you a much better performance because you can use cross-polarized. So there's no such case that the directional is a bad antenna. I'm just saying that um, you have to look at it and consider these sort of trade-offs in terms of which antenna you use. Often find for commercial and machine to machine applications, this is often better. Um, for home users, um, people that actually have got a signal problem, um, a directional antenna is a much better option. High gain is not always better, okay? And you find that the beam width as you get lower gain is bigger. So in other words, if you look at beam width, that would be a high gain antenna. This would be low gain. Of course, they align much easier, for example. These guys here, you have to start aligning quite carefully. Uh, when you get to these guys, they're going down tunnels, so not a big problem. The gain is everything. But remember that as you don't always have to go for the highest gain here. This guy may be quite useful. It's virtually omnidirectional, and it still gives you MIMO performance. If you look at omni antennas, the curve is always lower because uh, the only way an omni can force gain is by compressing the elevation, this type of pattern. You just always have to radiate in all the directions, so it's a much lower curve. And if you use high gain antennas here, this beam gets quite narrow, which could be a problem on moving vehicles. Um, you have to mount it quite vertical. You can't just sort of mount it on a, a, a loose pole or a pole that's not standing absolutely upright. And that's sort of the trade-offs. They also get longer. So they get bigger this way, um, in terms of the uh, directional antennas and in terms of omnis, you can see that's a flat guy, sort of a, uh, that's about 20 centimeters. And these guys are getting towards five, 500 millimeters or half a meter, etc. So they get longer as well. So there's a size consideration when you're going for a higher gain antenna and you're starting to get a very focused beam either sideways or in the direction of the base station. These are the antenna types we're often confronted with. And just getting some properties of the antennas. This is a, a Yagi antenna. This would be a log periodic antenna. And this would be a panel antenna. Now, um, a, a Yagi antenna could often be used in cases where you've got, say, LoRa or something that's a narrow frequency band. Um, that's only if you know that in future, no other frequencies may be added. So future proof often low because it's quite specific to a, a, a certain band. The actual performance, the gain of this antenna is actually quite high. So if you know that there's only going to be one frequency used forever, quite good. Um, of course, that would be low because you can't put much in terms of technologies or different bands onto an antenna with a narrow band. And if you want to use MIMO, you require more than one antenna. The log periodic is almost the opposite of that. This antenna performs from a low frequency defined by the largest elements to a high frequency defined by these. And the one that we make goes from almost uh, 700 megahertz up to three gigahertz and gives you performance over that whole band. So its performance is not as high. In other words, its gain is not as high as say a Yagi antenna, but it will give it to you everywhere. Um, so in terms of future proof, and that we've certainly seen, it's extremely high, so people have added bands that we didn't even know of when we designed the antenna, and it could still receive them.
reliability is quite high just because of construction. Um, one product for many technologies, certainly I you can put splitters on there and use it for different technologies to connect to. And you can use it for MIMO. Um, we've got a bracket that you can mount one of these horizontal, one vertical, and get excellent MIMO performance. But it's a big antenna. This is about one meter. If you then look at panel antennas, panel antennas, um, they're nice. They're sort of more rectangular, flat. They're unobtrusive. Um, frequency bands very much by design. But always the higher gain requires the bigger panel. And people trying to sell you a high gain antenna with a panel that's not as big as it should be is actually just um, hoodwinking you. It's a physical limitation. You can't get gain out of a very small panel. Um, feature proof is high depending on what you select because we do design these in certain bands um, specifically so that you can decide whether you may at some point need another band and we can include it. Um, reliability, medium to high, performance, quite good. And of course, it's a product that can support many technologies, but the biggest advantage is with these antennas, we often can integrate into a single enclosure two antennas, um, 45 degree, or oh, sorry, 90 degrees polarized relative to each other, which gives you virtually your full MIMO gain. Um, if it's a two by two MIMO system, if it's four by four, you have to use two of these, and I'll show that a bit later. If you go look at Omnis, there's what I call, and we call it the thickness factor of antennas. We get antennas which are very thin. And you can visually see it there. That would be a higher gain one. That would be a low sort of magnetic mount one. And if they are thin, they are never broadband. So some of them could be dual band. So you could find an antenna like this that could give you, say, performance at some part of the 900 and some part of the 1700 band. But it will just be two dips in the performance. The same on these very tall ones, they're either very narrow band or they would break up in terms of the pattern. The pattern will not stay in the direction which you um, typically want to talk to, which is the horizontal direction. And the way to distinguish them is to look visually. Are they thin? If they are thin, they are not broadband. Okay. Um, so often people start using them at simple applications. They find that they work because work is such a, a dumb term. And I honestly want to use the, the, the word dumb because you could be close to a base station. Anything could work, et cetera. You could be at a frequency band where it happens to perform OK, et cetera. They're not very rugged typically. Um, and the, the performance is medium if you accept the narrow band um, because Otherwise, you get the pattern breakup. So they could quote your high gains, but the gain could be in a direction where it's absolutely useless for communication. If you look at the, these set of antennas, that's a low gain antenna, uh, in our case, Omni 39. Uh, that's a newer version that we're doing that covers. These ones cover a really massive band. They cover um, roughly about 700 megahertz up to the high end uh, bands of 2.7 gigahertz. And the one thing that you will notice is that they are fat. Now, I'm not going to explain to someone how to design antennas, but I can tell you that it is impossible to design an antenna that covers a wide frequency band, which is not fat as well. So thickness factor is actually a requirement. So, of course, it doesn't look as neat and thin as that guy, but it will actually cover all of the bands or all of the bands that it claim and many more bands than you can ever do with a thin antenna such as that. That is just a higher gain version of the same thing. But once again, you have to compare that with that. And you can see it's a fatter antenna, um, about 500, 600 millimeter long. And it can actually give you a wide frequency band and good pattern performance over that whole band. But that is certainly just not possible with a thin antenna. And ultimately, only you get low profile antennas. Um, they can't ever be as good as an antenna like this. They compromise one way or the other. But here you have to look at the actual performance of it. In other words, is it really omnidirectional? If the gain of these antennas are specified high, they're actually bad because they've got some kind of beam in one direction, whereas you would like a beam in most directions. So here you should go for a low gain antenna uh, with a decent pattern performance. And they're compromised, but they're nice and rugged. And 
if they're designed with a wide frequency band, of course, uh, nice future proof, and they're often used in machine to machine. But I think future proof is crucial because you don't want to have something where you go change antennas um, every 18 months. MIMO. MIMO is an extremely important aspect in both the um, Wi Fi band, if you look at any of the technologies, especially 802, 11AC, but even um, 11N and anything uh, above 3G, in other words, the LTE bands, they use MIMO, more than one antenna on both the transmit side and the receive side. And what MIMO simply does, it's separate from everything else. It's simply, if you've got two by two MIMO, it's got the potential to double your data rate, okay? So you don't have to use two antennas with a MIMO modem. So just because the modem has got two ports, doesn't mean you have to put two antennas on. If your application does not require high throughput, and throughput's all you get with MIMO, then you can go with a single antenna, and it's often a very simple solution. The one thing you have to be careful of, some of the hardware don't like you to leave the one port open, but you can simply put a little stubby antenna, which normally is supplied with the modem, onto that other port, and that would be fine. You can also terminate it, but I would say stubby antenna, more than good enough, um, if the hardware complains about only having one antenna. But do remember that, only one antenna necessary unless throughput is the important consideration. Here we've got an integrated MIMO antenna, so inside here is two antennas, also two cables coming out. You can of course also do MIMO by combining two single antennas, like that, mounting the one and polarized differently to the other one. So in this case, the one would be horizontally polarized, the one would be vertically polarized. Inside an enclosure, you can put one antenna there. Typically also like to have one polarized in one direction and the other in another direction and connect both of them. So these would be two by two MAMA. You don't always need an integrated one. You can also do your own thing, um, providing two antennas. Just if it's two by two, the best um, separation or uh, decorrelation is always provided by polarization. If it's more, then you have to go to something like four by four MAMA. Now, 4x4 MIMO, and we don't have an antenna that's got four antennas. Ah, oh, sorry, we do have one, I think, at Wi-Fi bands. That's 4x4 integrated. But otherwise, you can use two 2x2s, two two, and you can space them. And I'll show you the spacing a little bit later. And that will give you 4x4. And of course, if you want Omni, you can actually go and mount four Omni antennas next to each other. You can also mount two next to each other and two above them, etc. cetera. So um, once again, that would be 4x4 four four MIMO. 4x4 four four MIMO, you're relying, on, um, uh, you're relying on the reflections to give you 4x4 four four because polarization can only give you two, double your speed. But these guys can also make use of reflections to find two different pathways between a transmitter and receiver. So they have to be mounted some distance apart. And I'll give you an indication of how far they have to be mounted apart. Now we look at implementation you always or often have a coaxial cable leading to an antenna and the only important parts that I want to highlight here is the attenuation per meter goes up as frequency goes up the loss in the cable is higher if the cable is thin it's also dependent on the technology used but generally speaking if it's thin it has got a higher loss and you can use it for um, smaller lengths or for lower frequencies. And then typically you find this curve. So if you find the losses are high and you want to go to lower losses, you can see these cables are much thicker. So cable loss is also typically related to the diameter of the coaxial cable and the cost of course increases as you want lower losses. So I think those are the important aspects. Look at the distance. You know, is it, is it relevant? In other words, if you've got half a meter, you can see that perhaps 0 0.2, 0 0.4 dB loss is not relevant. But if you're going to use um, 10 meters, then that's becoming 4 dBs and that's becoming 6 dBs. And then, of course, the frequency at which you wish to operate. So um, power handling and the thicker uh, ones if you've got high power transmitters, but often not the case in uh, cellular and Wi-Fi cases. Bent radius is important. 
and it is defined for each cable. Typically, the thinner ones you can bend sharper than the fatter ones, which is useful in an enclosure where you only need a, a small bit of cable price. And then an important one, connector availability. Not all cables can connect to all connectors. Connectors is a nice topic. Um, you get a variety, and these are just the illustration. That's a smallish connector called a sub miniature, um, I think type A. And uh, one of the interesting aspects, I'm not sure most people may know it, the sex of a connector is defined by that inner part. So if the inner part's a pin, it's a male connector. Um, that guy there, you can see the inner part is a pin, even though the outer part is a receptacle. In other words, it may look like female. The sex of a connector is defined by the inner part. That guy there, end-type connector, would be a male end-type connector. This guy here, or lady, if you want to call it that, is a female, okay, because you can see the inner part as a whole. And then, like um, the rest of life, we also got sort of some sexual variations uh, where people would use a connector which on the outside looks like a male, uh, but on the inside uh, it's actually a female. Uh, often these were dictated when people said, uh, especially the American FCC, they would say that we uh, want a certain ERP, in other words, effective radiated power, and that's a combination of the power of the transmitter and the antenna. So I said to the guys, if you supply an antenna with we want to make sure you, the guy can only use the right antenna and they have to change um, something like this, which makes it impossible to put a standard connector on. But of course, the industry being clever, nowadays you can buy what they call reverse polarity SMA connectors. They're very different in size, by the way. So you find that this guy can connect to the thicker cables, but it will virtually be impossible to connect that guy to a thicker cable. The, Solution often is to use an intermediate cable and make a little lead that would connect the two to each other if you really need to do this. This is a connector that's used in vehicles. So you can see it's mechanical. It's, it's very similar to one of these, I think that one there, but it mechanically interlocks group dust, water protection. Um, and of course, this is also important in selecting the right connector. The one thing that's very important is um, beware of making up your own cables. Um, if you do make up cables, I would say you must always measure it with an RF network analyzer because that's the only way. I've seen so many connectors, uh, often because they're badly connected, but even some connectors just don't work at the frequencies where you may require them to be um, operational. So either buy them from a reputable um, manufacturer that measures them, or otherwise be very careful of just making it up in the field and um, assuming that it would work. This is perhaps one of the nicer ones. Um, this is indicating the separation between antennas. And people ask me all the time, and many people can criticize our figures here, but they're pretty accurate. In other words, how far do you need to position things apart? And you can see it's a function of the gain of the antenna, the blue line there. So if it's a low gain antenna, and if they're high again, you have to position them further apart for MIMO performance. Reason for that is that the beam gets narrower, so the reflections are no longer that far off the path of the main beam, and hence they need to be further apart to get some decorrelation. So these numbers here, I think, are excellent numbers to use. If it's a panel antenna, it's from the one edge of the panel to the next edge here. And if it's an omni antenna, it's, of course, from the center of the two antennas all perhaps a side, but should be more or less the same thing. So this perhaps is a one curve I would print out and use because I get asked this question all the time. It's not a scientific answer, but it's the one that would most of the time give you quite good results. Lightning, and we often get asked about lightning. Uh, lightning, the best model to describe lightning is using the rolling ball model. Um, if you're looking at short structures, a rolling ball gets to your 45 degree type of rule that people have used for years. In other words, you find that that ball, so wherever the ball touch, lightning can hit. Let me just start at that point. So if you look at this rolling ball, if it rolls up, lightning can hit anywhere on this building, even though this is higher. People didn't believe me, I promise you. We've had high rise buildings, fourth floor down, the guy gets hit by lightning. So this is a very real 
impact once a building is more than about 50, 60 meters high. If it's small, it's this size, like a little tower, 20 or 30 meters high, you can see no problem. But this is the rolling ball model. It's a very, very good guideline in terms of where things can be by lightning. So do not believe in certain high structures that mounting it away from the top will protect you against lightning. The rolling ball is the most accurate way of doing it. And if it's short structures, your 45 degree um, rule, which normally says that if you've got something there, 45 degrees from it either side, you'll be protected. That's quite true if it's a small um, structure. Um, antenna mounting pole must be earthed. I know people hate this, but if it's not earthed, you're achieving nothing because that rod that you put up on top that protects the unit will be hit. And if it's not earthed, it will arc over to the coaxial cable and run all the way into the house, arcing over to everything else that it can hit. Okay. If there's a equipment building and an, another building, for example, if there's a mast and there's equipment building, the earths must be interconnected. Um, people are once again arguing with me that if I've got a mast outside and a building, I don't want to connect those earths because the mast is going to be hit. What happens when that mast is hit? If it is not connected to the earth of the building, it will rise up to a few thousand volts and everything will arc over to the equipment inside the building. If they are connected, both will rise up to a few thousand volts and there's no difference between them. So do believe me, you interconnect earths between say a mast and a building, or one building and the other building. Here's an indication of the rolling ball. Once again, if the mast is high and when I say high, I mean sort of 60, 70 meters plus, you have to start protecting things on this side. Um, if you want to protect them, you can just put a spike out there and a spike out there, okay, so that the ball can't touch the antenna. It's not impossible. At first, people look at this and say, how the hell do I protect things? You actually put a, a spike out the, uh, horizontally so that the ball can't touch the antenna, in which case lightning won't hit it. But just being above the top is not good enough. On smaller units, that's fine because the ball relatively speaking, will almost form your 45 degree line. And just having a pole higher than the antenna would be good enough. The rule that I use in terms of small structures, that's like mounting antennas on roofs and uh, masts, smaller masts, is that the mast must extend above the antenna, the amount that the antenna extends away from the, sorry, away from the mast horizontally. So if it's a log periodic, like this guy here, that spike there should be the same length as that. And if it's a panel antenna, it can be much lower because it only needs to be the same distance as that distance over there. Um, for Omnis, it's always best to mount them at the top in terms of performance, okay? And you can mount them like that. You do risk that lightning can hit them, but in the case of a properly earthed antennas and if you actually go to the inside of, for example, our antennas, we always make sure the whole antenna is earthed through to the braid and earthed through to the bracket. You won't get damage except the antenna will go to pot. Okay. So sometimes if the antenna is not mounted on a specifically high structure, on a building, and there's still trees around it, mounting it at the top is not bad. Um, but you do risk losing the antenna and most probably the equipment will be damaged. So I wouldn't do it on a tall structure that's very likely to be by um, lightning one way or the other. That is it. I do hope that uh, we managed to ask some of the questions. The talk really comes from addressing many, many questions from um, various of our customers, customers, customers. And uh, what I would really encourage you is where things were unclear in terms of the presentation, um, ask questions. I'm not sure how many people have asked questions uh, in the chat box. Um, we can sit and answer some of them. Uh, people that's finished listening can actually um, leave the webinar, but you can still write us emails. That's why the emails are there at the bottom and uh, we can answer questions. It's very difficult, especially where one sits in a webinar and I'm just talking to you to see what's the stuff that may have confused people. So please don't hesitate, ask the questions and we can clarify them. And most probably we'll send to all people that attended the answers to these um, questions. I hope this has been useful. Thank you very much for 
listening to me for this time. Hi, Andre, I'm Stephen speaking. Um, we do have three questions that you can maybe just help with. Um, yes. The first question is regarding MIMO. And the question was, um, what type of polarization? Is it better to have polarization or spatial diversity or spatial separation when we are looking at MIMO? Okay, MIMO, it's always, always better to have polarization. Um, the only problem with polarization is that you only have two completely decorrelated polarizations. Those are 90 degrees, whether it's plus minus 45 or vertical horizontal. And people argue with me, but even if your base station is vertical horizontal and your customer's um, unit is 45, you still get full decorrelation. So always best to use polarization. But of course, if you need to go more than um, two by two, your only option is to go for spatial. But always best to go for um, polarization first, up to two by two, and then you can go for um, space diversity. Thank you, Andre. And then there was another question uh, regarding the thick antennas that you referred to. That's the Omni antennas. Um, what makes them wide band? Um, maybe you can just give, give a little bit more information as to why are they wide band and the thinner antennas are not wide band? Um, I suppose the first answer is uh, if you, and that gets back to the theory, um, there's an antenna theory, and if you go look it up, there's something called the antenna thickness factor. And that's actually the log of the antenna length divided by its diameter. And that determines the fundamental bandwidth of, say, a dipole antenna. There's another factor, though, if you go more and more broadband, is that you also have to cater for more frequencies. So you have to shape that um, radiator of yours. And you can only do it, you can't do it on a single radiator. You almost need to provide additional radiators in order to handle the different bands. The most difficult part is when you go for a high gain antenna, because on a high gain antenna is essentially often using two antennas that spaced above each other. And of course, as the wavelength change, you may find that they cause the beam to squeak upwards. Um, lately, we use a fantastic new technology called closely coupled dipoles where we can create a constant phase difference across there. But none of that can happen if you don't have width to play with one way or the other. Uh, we even have to feed those closely coupled dipoles. We have to feed them multiple places along their length. Now you can just imagine just getting feeds up there requires a certain amount of width. So um, there's a number of reasons, but certainly impossible to get without um, using some width in order to get there. Good. Thank you, Andre. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, if there are any other questions, please do send it to us. Uh, you'll see the email address info at pointing.tech. And uh, please send us your questions or just carry on logging them in the questions box. Uh, within this webinar and we'll get back to each of you individually um, and if there's any topics we'll also that that are of interest to everybody we'll send it to everybody we'll also be distributing the the slides and also a link to youtube with uh, this webinar thank you very much andre thanks a lot um, you guys can just uh, maybe stay online for a few seconds just to answer the um, the questions at the end uh, just to write the webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody.